thank you so much, uh, Father Innocent. We, we do have a couple minutes uh, left this evening for questions from the audience. Timothy has originally thought of the, the theory of ecumenism mostly stemming from the West. Uh, however, you know, based on your presentation, the question ar arose whether or not this was actually an Eastern idea or an Eastern philosophy. Well, okay. My, my first qualification is that uh, I, don't, I don't know well enough about the ecumenical movement and all of these various philosophies that could or could not be involved. Um, my understanding of ecumenism is, like you said, it sort of originated in Protestantism, basically. Um, so I'm not, I'm not like necessarily directly implying that they were all reading Hindu books and having Hindu ideas and said, let's get together and do a Hindu thing. I think that this sort of idea is really a natural one that anyone could sort of reach just with their own thinking. Um, you know, I mean, that's what the Hindus were doing. They're, I mean, among philosophers, you know, they're very, very good philosophers. Uh, it's, it's an idea that you can arrive at just through your natural reasoning. So I would not contend exactly that ecumenism is from an Eastern source, but I think that the, the whole spirit is, uh, is very similar. Is, is, is there any conception of good and evil, uh, particularly due to the multiplicity of gods and some of them being uh, rather fierce and gruesome looking um, and uh, you know how if there is what what is the conception of of that is that correct <laughs> okay <laughs> being paraphrased but yes so of course the, the first answer is that well there's a multiplicity of views on that <laughs> which is what you would expect um, and it depends on what perspective you want to look at things from, I guess, is what the Hindus would say. So they have, they definitely have ideas of morality. Um, for instance, one thing uh, we talked about in our, our class uh, was what they call Vyakti Dharma, which is, like I said, there's, they, Dharma has lots of applications. And what this was, was your individual Dharma as like an individual human person. And it was basically a long list of virtues. And they're, you know, these are the good things that you're supposed to do. And they have ideas, uh, one is called ahizma. I think the Buddhists have an idea which means non-injury. And they, it's very bad to injure another person. So they have, they have ideas that you could identify with morality. Um, but like I've also said, they have, Brahman is impersonal. And it is above all qualifications. So from the highest perspective, I think they would say, um, you know, it's, it's beyond good and evil. That's a distinction, so you can't apply it. Um, this book I was telling you about um, that I read from the Ramakrishna mission, um, it's, it's greatly simplified, but he, and they used sort of Western terms to appeal to Westerners, but he said directly, God created good and evil, straight out, um, which I think if you would logically follow that point, there, there couldn't be good and evil because um, so it, it depends on how they want to look at it. And of course, I mean, they are human and <laughs> they have innate senses of what is good and what is evil. So there's, there's, there's a lot of things going on. But I, I think probably from the highest Brahmanical philosophical point of view, they would have to say, you know, good and evil end up being nil uh, because they're, they're contrary things. So everything has to be subsumed in the unity. That's what I would think. Of course, I'm not, I'm not Shankara. <laughs> With apologies in advance, um, the, the question, Father, was related to the Mokshu and their quest for uh, basically non-existence as a, as a way to escape um, and how that fits in with this idea of Brahman uh, that sustains everything and uh, I think, right? Yeah, okay. Well, first I'll distinguish terms. Um, and forgive me if this wasn't clear. Moksha is, is the word they use to describe this, this liberation or however you want to call it, escape. Um, I, don't, I don't believe there's any people called Mok, Mokshu or something like that. I had pictures of the Sanyasin who are, that means something like renouncer and they renounce the world and pursue Moksha. So I'll distinguish that uh, from the beginning. Uh, 
Mm. Also, it, it has to sort of do with what I was talking about, uh, the, the point and the shapes and the lines. So I was saying that the point, um, it's not actually part of the, the space, even though it's the principle. It's, you know, it's, it's almost like it's nothing. It's sort of hard to understand when you try to think about it. Um, and then I described, um, at least in that one interpretation of what moksha consisted of, was to literally identify yourself with Brahman. Now, Brahman is, like I said, it's sort of above being or non-being. Um, and to identify yourself with it, I mean, this is just you know, my understanding from what I've read. I haven't done it. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, it gets you out of samsara, which is it's the whole world in all eternity, the world. Even the gods are subject to samsara. Um, so it's, it's like, I mean, you, you say that they're uniting themselves with a thing, but Brahman is not a thing. And, and furthermore, the uniting actually, well, this has to do with yoga, which I didn't have any time to talk about. But uh, the idea of this union is that it's, it's like the realization of something that's already the case and not attaining something new. So it's almost, I don't know how to describe it, but it's just like a total negation of existing in the world and to... I mean, it's, I don't know how to describe it. Do you, do you sort of get where I'm leading with this idea? On the line and off the line. <laughs> On the line and off the line. Uh, could you ask another question? Maybe I could better define it Maybe. if that's necessary. Or the follow-up question is, you know, based on the geometrical uh, example of the point existing and non-existing at the same time, and, and mokshu being sort of the, the pursuit of unification with that point or the non-existence, how does this correlate to or, or relate to the orthodox um, idea or, or belief of deification? Okay, so that's a difficult one. Um, I actually heard His Eminence Metropolitan Chrysostomos of blessed memory talk about this once, or maybe saw it in something he wrote. Um, he was calling to mind that image of all of the rivers flowing into the sea, which is taken to be an image of the sort of individual selves being subsumed in this unity and they sort of disappear um, as individual things. Uh, but I think, and if anyone else remembers, remembers this, if it was written or if they heard him said it, but he said that the difference in orthodoxy is something like you, you go into that sea, the sea of being, I believe St. Gregory the Theologian uses that term, um, but you, you still remain just one drop in that sea. In the, in the Hindu idea, it's like your, your identity is completely lost, and there's just the sea. But his eminence said that you're still that drop. You're still a human person. Um, of course, we talk about God as being above all being and non-being, um, but you, you, of course, your, your human nature, your essence, is never identified with the essence of God. Um, a, a very impor important point, which, which is precisely what the, the Hindu idea here is, is that you already are sort of essentially identified with God. So I don't know if that image helps you more. I think it's, you can only speak in images about it. Thank you. Father shared, Father shared that um, in his in his studies in college, the, there was also a, a class in, of major re religions, and the professor shared a, a point that in the Hindu understanding, um, their belief that all religions lead to God, uh, with with the caveat that if your religion doesn't agree with that overarching belief, that there are many paths to the same truth, then that isn't an actual path to the truth. Um, so do, do you have a comment to, to add or, or to expand on that, that thought, Father? So you're saying that the idea is that if you don't agree that, that all religions can lead to God, then you're wrong. So if, if we're Christians and we say we have an exclusivity, 
then that means that we're the only ones who are actually excluded, is the idea. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, I can't say that I know Hindu thought well enough to say if that would be something that they would say. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, my understanding, they have this idea of reality. Like I said, that every, everything is created, and even though it's a cyclical thing, so it, it's never really created in the sense that we understand it. But like I said, the, the, they say that moksha is the ultimate goal of every self, and there's almost just this, this wave that just goes, um, at least was the way I understood it. So, I mean, I would think if, and of course you have to also understand they have reincarnation, so it's not like you get just one chance. Uh, you can go as many times as you need to go to get it. Um, so, I mean, I can see how they, how they would say that, you know, that's just not right because they have this idea of the one being in the many, of sort of everything has to contain this principle of truth. So then, I mean, if you just said, if you denied that, you would have to be wrong, I guess from their perspective, but at the same time, it's, I don't know. I, I can't really answer that or respond to that in a proper way, I think. Uh, again, apologies in advance. Uh, mother's, mother's question is, what's the point? <laughs> no, mother, mother's question is, uh, you know, how, how, do, how, how do the different religious practices and, and rituals um, um, lead or fit in within this cycle um, that lead or point to moksha that is much more philosophical and seems to not have those sort of baser elements. Um, so how, how do that, how does, what's the connection there? What's the point of the, the baser sides of the Hindu thought and praxis, you know, leading, how does that lead to is that? That's good. Oh, sure. okay. Yeah, I understand the question. Uh, thankfully, that one's a little bit easier to answer. Uh, actually, uh, it, it it covers topics that I left out of this presentation. Um, so the the first thing I have to say is I, I made only this very small comment about this at the end. But the Hindus have this very uh, pervasive idea about hierarchy within existence, existing things. So you know you have you have gods which are part of the sort of the world order. Um, and then you know you have whatever great heroes, and you have men, you have animals and demons. So you have this great hierarchy of beings, and they're all sort of your your place in there. And of course, you can move through it because you have cycles of reincarnation. Um, your place is sort of determined by how 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 close you are to to union with Brahman. So I'll I'll say that first of all. So they have within Hindu society, there are, you know, of course, there's, you're on the rank of human, but then there are subdivisions. There's, there's different ranks, sort of, of humans. And unless I'm mistaken, they do really have this idea that, you know, someone who's a really great intellectual person is sort of closer to, closer to this than someone who is, who is lower. So they're, they're sort of like on a lower degree of being. Um, so they have that idea of this hierarchy, which is the first point. So there's, there's sort of this idea of, you know, they, there wouldn't be any possibility of them understanding that in this life. So I think that's one reason, you know, they're not, they're not preaching as such, or at least I don't think they do. Um, the other thing is about yoga. Uh, I didn't talk about this, but yoga, first of all, it doesn't, um, it's not like what you think, uh, contortionist stretches and new age music, not, not really the main part of yoga. Um, yoga literally means union comes from the same word as yoke in the English language, to join two things together, to yoke them. Um, so it means union, and, but it also is often translated as disciplines or methods. And they identify four main yogas, uh, which are, well, it's not so important, but there's bhakti, jnana, uh, karma yoga, and raja yoga. Uh, and, what, and what we want to talk about is bhakti yoga which is often translated as the path of devotion. Um, so it's understood that all of these yogas, and I don't need to tell you about the other ones, but um, they're, all, they're all sort of these practical methods that are employed by Hindus to attain union. 
So bhakti yoga, the path of devotion, and, and, and each one of these is sort of assigned to different classes of people, like someone who is sort of on a lower, they can only understand things emotionally, or then again, for jnana yoga is like this, this high philosophical, you know, raising yourself th through mental things, and, or then they have meditations and things like that. But bhakti yoga is specifically um, this devotion to the gods. They, they actually, like I said, they, they really do have this idea. It's not, it's not just apologetics that, that they're sort of, through the individual gods, um, they're accessing the one. So, and, and I didn't talk about this either, but often even the gods that they have aren't even understood uh, necessarily as like personal beings, but sort of as just these, these images they use of like powers of Brahman. Um, so, I did, well, I did have an image at the beginning. If you remember all the way back at the beginning, there was this, this woman with all these arms with three other gods under. That was an image of what they call Trimurti, which has been termed the Hindu trinity. But it's, they have these three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Uh, but they're, they're used in this sense actually just as these, these sort of symbolic representations of creating, sustaining, and destroying. So they have that idea too. So, of course, I don't know all the specifics about bhakti yoga, but the idea is really that this, these devotional practices that they have, which include you know, singing hymns and offering sacrifices. They, are, they usually sacrifice fruits and sweets, actually. They don't think they do animal sacrifice. Um, but all of these devotional things, they even, they even dress up the idols and like, you know, give them necklaces and stuff. But this, this is understood to be somehow using their sort of emotional faculty of even love to sort of draw near to the one God through, through these devotional practices. So it's probably understood by you know, the philosophers that this is sort of like a lower level, at least I would think that, but it's, it's still appropriate and it'll help you to get there, I think is the idea. So, so the question, Father, was uh, you know, about the, the, the nature of time and the fact that it's cyclical in the Hindu understanding, and yet at sort of the beginning part of your lecture, you uh, brought up the fact that they also have sort of an end stage. Uh, I'm not sure what the term was, but if you could expand on that um, or, or clarify that, okay. please. Um. I, I don't know all of the details of that particular teaching, but I think I can uh, maybe get some idea uh, based on other elements. Um, and the, the simple answer is I would, th I would say that sort of, yes, they do have an idea of cycles within cycles. Um, the reason I say that is because they have a very developed idea of what you would call like microcosms and macrocosms. Uh, that sort of stack on top of one, one another. Um, so, I mean, I guess to exp explain that, um, I mean, the idea of cycles, this is, there, there are definitely cycles within cycles. I guess the easiest examples would be, like, one of the smallest cycles would be a breath in and out. It's a full cycle. And they would probably try to see that as a microcosm of the entire thing. Um, and f for instance, they have another idea. Um, if you ever see the symbol that's often used to represent Hinduism, I don't know how to describe it, but it's this sort of wavy thing with a dot on top. You've probably seen it before. That's, that's called the Om or the Aum symbol. And this is another example of the same thing. It's this tiny, it's a single syllable, but they actually divide Ah, uh, um, into the three parts that represent the entirety of all manifestation, coming from, well, of course, coming from complete silence to this first syllable uttered, and then it goes through to a termination, returns to non-existence. So they have this idea of everything sort of being an image of everything else, because um, because they all have the same single principle. So while I don't know all of the, what they teach about the yugas, um, I would think that that's, that's reasonable to assume that they have that kind of idea. You said there was an end, like an end. Yes. The Kali Yuga is what they call it. Um, I don't remember the specifics on this. I, I think they divide 
the whole cycle of manifestation from from like everything being non-existent in potential in Brahman, uh, one whole cycle returning to that. I think it's four yugas. Don't quote me on that. It might be six, or they they might be subdivided endlessly. I don't know. Um, uh, but yes, they do. They do have this idea of. A, a, a sort of beginning and an end to the cycle, and the Kali Yuga is understood to be the the final the final stage. And I think it can be applied to every cycle. So it's the end of the whole world process that leads into a new one. But it, you would probably also apply it to I don't know, like the seasons. Um, in winter, everything is sort of destroyed and dissolved, but then it comes back. So does that answer yeah. sort of what you're looking for? Okay. Well. Father, thank you so much. I, I do have one of my own questions that I was saving. Yeah. Um, you, you, you know, brought to our attention the emphasis on praxis, on practice, um, and that they have a tradition of uh, ascesis and almost monasticism, in a sense, uh, as well as a very lofty theology or metaphysical teaching, um, and yet, as His Eminence pointed out, it's somewhat sinister, or, or I think you said that it's sort of depressing, you know, this being trapped in the cycle to where their end goal is non-existence. Um, you know, in the Orthodox Church, we have also, you know, rituals, praxis, ascesis. We know and have a tradition of the Apostle Thomas you know, traveling all the way to India and 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 preaching, um, have there been modern, I guess, uh, missionary efforts to basically the the in, the Indian people or the Hindus to say, look, you know, here's something that actually has hope at the end, and not and you don't instead of having non-existence, like you know, there is actually something to look forward to, good. Um, do you, are you aware of, of missionary efforts to India? Because we know that their thoughts have really infiltrated the Western, you know, zeitgeist, and there's a lot of people really interested in yoga and all these other Hindu um, thoughts or practices. Has you know, has there been any attempt to to share with them the truth that the Orthodox Church contains? Um. Well, on the whole, I just have to claim ignorance. I do remember when Bishop Ambrose was visiting, visiting the seminary, I believe he did say that he had a mission and maybe it was Singapore. And I just, I remember his comment was, he didn't, he didn't talk much about this one, but I think he said when, when he was, you know, trying to, to missionize these people, he was talking to one man, and they, you know, he had given him an icon of Christ. And, he's, and he was like, wow, you, you have a very great God. And so he put it up with all his other images. And he said, he used that as a point to, to say that they, it's so ingrained in them that they cannot understand the idea of exclusivity. Um, that's the only comment I can make. I don't, I don't know how widespread any, any missionary efforts are. It's just a, a story I remember that's nice to share. Forgive me. Well, I think, thank you. And um, I, I'd like to close uh, tonight's public lecture by thanking Father Innocent on behalf of the entire seminary community and um, our guests. Um, and, and I think that, again, you know, an event like this not only demonstrates um, what our, our future clergy uh, you know, should be equipped to to answer questions on, um, but also to to know, you know, having the future clergy um, continue, you know, and and build on on everything that we've been so uh, blessed to have in our parishes right now, and make sure that that we continue having clergy that are able to share the real beauty and lofty theology of the Orthodox Church um, and not only retain and have the capacity, you know, for, uh, you know, the current Orthodox Christians to grow and deepen in their faith, but also um, attract 
people from, from all walks of life that may be seeking. And instead of finding that in Eastern religions and Hinduism, um, they, they will find the truth in the Orthodox Church. So thank you so much. Uh, Father, can, can we, or Your Eminence, can we end with a prayer, please?